You may not live or work in a region prone to wildfires, but as the planet gets warmer, you'll have to prepare for smoke and flames one way or another. It wasn't vegetation leading to more homes burning. It wasn't trees lighting houses on fire. It was fire moving from house to house in a fairly densely built area. Erica Fleischmann is a wildfire and climate change expert at Oregon State University. She says flare-ups are becoming more common and increasingly intense, resulting in far-reaching disruptions to security, the supply chain, and health. So if people can't go back home, you basically have not just the community that was hit by the climate-related disaster, but you have strains that carry over to other communities. We'll examine what you need to do to prepare your team for the direct and indirect impacts of wildfires. How do you get information out to a lot of people and then manage the distribution of those people in the event of an emergency? We'll also look at three factors to keep in mind when assessing the threat of global warming and why the most powerful military in the world considers climate change to be a huge security risk. Hello there, I'm Tristan Field-Jones and welcome to another edition of SITREP. Erica Fleischmann joins us now and Erica, tell us a little bit about yourself and the work you do before we really dig into this topic. Yeah, thanks very much for, for the opportunity to talk with you. My name is Erica Fleischmann. I'm director of the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute and a professor at Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. The Oregon Climate Change Research Institute was started by the Oregon legislature about 15 years ago, and we study climate science and also how climate change affects Oregon's natural and human systems. Okay. We have uh, a lot of uh, people who may be listening to this wondering, okay, why exactly are we talking to a wildfire and climate change expert on a security podcast? We're going to connect those dots very shortly because there are a lot of commonalities, if you will, between those two subjects, because increasingly people are treating climate change and specifically wildfires as a security threat. But let's just cover some of the basics here real quick. Uh, Erica, when it comes to wildfires, what have you done in terms of, uh, of study surrounding that particular disaster and what have you noticed over your career doing so? Yeah, well, a lot of people are studying this. And so what, what OCRI, the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute, tries to do is to pull together um, the emerging science and expertise. Um, some of that is traditional knowledge. Some of that is more Western science um, to try to understand how fire patterns are changing and how that affects uh, people in nature. And obviously those are pretty strongly connected. Um, and much of what much of what we do is applicable to a larger area. So we don't stop at the Oregon border. A lot of what, um, what I could say about wildfire in Oregon is applicable across much of the Western United States and in a lot of dry regions around the world, um, in Australia, in, um, in Spain and along the Mediterranean coast. And so the types of changes that we're seeing across the Western United States um, and to some extent other regions of the United States are, are not, not isolated. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that any changes in wildfire are affected by and occurring against a backdrop of where people are living and what people are doing. So um, we often think about wildfire as being um, being driven by, you know, you have to have a spark <laughs> for a fire to start. And where people are um, affects, affects sparks because people create sparks. Um, and then having vegetation that is that is relatively flammable. And in many cases, uh, wind is also a really big contributor to a fire spreading um, and to the extent to which a fire can be contained if humans want to contain it. So um, in general, across much of the Western United States and again, other areas, um, fires are becoming more frequent and they are becoming larger. Yeah. And this probably isn't really a surprise to a lot of people uh, listening to this because we have seen the headlines over the last, especially over the last several years, where we've seen these gargantuan wildfires in many areas. Uh, I can think of 
uh, last year in 2021 when there is just this incredible heat dome over the Pacific Northwest into mm -hmm. British Columbia uh, and into that region of Canada where they had wildfires that just annihilated entire towns. And we've seen that in California. We've seen that in Australia. Uh, you know, not too, too long ago, Greece battled just in very intense wildfires. So unfortunately, this really does seem to be the reality we're dealing with nowadays. And with climate change, that's probably not going to mm -hmm. uh, to go away anytime soon. So uh, evidently, global warming is a big factor in the increase in the severity of these. But can you maybe drill down a little more specifically in terms of what is causing more uh, wildfires and more severe flare-ups? Are we looking at, is it the drier conditions? Is it the warmer temperatures? Is it stronger winds? What specifically uh, plays into the more severe wildfires? Yeah, a lot of it is increases in dryness. And so, um, so temperature plays a role in that. Um, so does precipitation. But But one way to think about it is that for any amount of precipitation. And it, so right now, the Western United States is in um, an un unprecedented drought. Um, so things are, it, very little precipitation has been received for a period of years. And really over the past 20 or so years, it's been quite dry. Um, over the long term, over longer periods of time, um, precipitation, total amount of precipitation has not decreased that, that much. Um, and precipitation across the region as climate continues to change, is likely to remain fairly consistent in terms of total amount or even increase a little bit. But as temperatures increase, there are a couple of major changes. One of them is that in mountainous areas, more precipitation is falling as rain than as snow. Um, and so the, the sustained water, there's less sustained water availability in many regions. Things tend to dry out faster. The other is that per, per unit of water, if temperatures are hotter, again, that water dissipates more rapidly. And so even if precipitation was not changing, um, the increase in temperature means that things tend to dry out more rapidly. And as anyone who's tried to, to build a fire in their fireplace or a campfire or anything like that is aware, um, dry vegetation burns much more easily than wet vegetation. Um, and then, you know, the temperatures temperatures can can exacerbate some of the actual conditions on the ground. And if people are trying to contain a fire, um, make conditions more dangerous for the people that are trying to put that fire out. There's not much evidence that wind patterns are changing per se, but what is happening is that when there are strong winds, which just happens periodically in most regions, those, um, those extreme winds may be more likely to coincide with periods that are quite dry and quite hot. And so in those, um, when you get that intersection of conditions, a fire tends to be more likely to spread if there's an, well, it's easier to ignite. It's more likely to spread if there's an ignition. And then it's that much more difficult to put out if people want to try to put it out. Increasingly, life and property is threatened by wildfires. Now, obviously, the severity and the intensity does have a factor, mm -hmm. but there's other components to this too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are there are more people in the world <laughs> than there used to be, and um, so you know the population is still growing, and um, and that that has an effect on most uh, most things that we would consider natural disasters, or the extent to which an extreme event becomes a disaster for people. Humans are expanding into places where traditionally humans didn't live, and in some cases, those are places that um, are more fire prone than places where humans traditionally lived. So you have expansion into areas with um, vegetation that tends to burn. So some ecosystems are fire prone naturally. Um, Southern California is a great example. M much of the vegetation in the Los Angeles area and the San Diego area um, is it evolved to burn relatively frequently. So people are building in those areas and they have a high likelihood of fire. Um, you also have the fact that sometimes people, well, this. People who sometimes are moving into areas that are fire prone maybe haven't lived in places like that in the past and are less conscious of how their actions um, inadvertently might start a wildfire. Um, they also might be less aware of ways that they can prepare their home 
um, their property, their community, what have you, to be resilient to wildfire. So you have an intersection of human knowledge um, of people living in places where they didn't always live um, and fire likelihood changing in general. And of course, Erica, I mean, those areas you mentioned are beautiful. People want mm-hmm. to live there. I mean, it's it's not difficult to see why we're expanding into these regions. When we look at the threat to property, I think that right there is is, is a connection because you know, if if you're in an area that has more people or some people period when no one used to live there, mm-hmm. suddenly that property is at risk pretty much regardless of what you do because, you know, wildfires have have happened for eons and eons. That's never going to change. But what hasn't happened for eons and eons is having human beings in these prone regions. So if we look at the property angle of this for just a second, Mm -hmm. what needs to be considered as more people move into these regions? Risk tolerance (laughs) is a big one, Um, ensuring that people are aware of this. Um, The... I mean, a lot of things are being discussed. There are no no easy answers to this. Um, the insurance sector, at least in some areas, is increasingly aware of their their financial losses. Um, and so it, in some regions, especially I'm aware of in California, it's becoming more difficult to get fire insurance. And so, um, you know, whether that is going to affect uh, where things develop and how they develop, you know, is an open question. Um, there are questions that are that are open ended right now. I think about whether building codes are going to change, whether from the insurance sector or from municipalities or anything else. So, to some extent, buildings can be made more fire resistant. Obviously, it costs money to do that, and that may or may not be desirable for some people. It also may or may not be feasible for some people. Um, you know, as the cost of housing increases and the cost of insurance increases, obviously. The people who have the financial ability to live in certain places or to be housed, period, um, is changing. And there's also the fact that in some areas, what we're what we're seeing more um, in recent years is fires um, that destroy a lot of homes and in some cases, unfortunately, lead to human mortality are occurring in places that really are fairly dense housing developments where traditionally one would not have expected um these types of extraordinary fires. So uh, the recent fire, the Marshall Fire in Colorado, basically went through a housing development. There are similar uh, cases in California and Oregon in recent years where these were not really what one would traditionally consider what sometimes is called the wildland urban interface, which I can kind of caricature as people living in little houses in the woods. I mean, these are fairly dense suburban areas where it wasn't vegetation, you know, leading to more homes burning. It wasn't trees lighting houses on fire. It was fire moving from house to house in a fairly um, densely built area. So obviously something started from from outside the area, but these weren't forest fires or brush fires. These were basically city fires. And that is unfortunately also becoming more common. Let's keep that in mind as we look at the security aspect of this because I think back to my high school days and I grew up on the Canadian prairies and I know a lot of high schools had tornado drills because tornadoes were a significant threat uh, during uh, well part of the school year anyway I can think of some places that would have hurricane drills right you know like these precautions for natural disasters so if we look at wildfires if you have a business in you know a place like California or Colorado, the Pacific Northwest, maybe Australia, Spain, wherever it may be in these regions that we're focusing on, what do you need to do when you're formulating that security plan to make sure that the pe- your employees or your colleagues are safe in the event of this? And, and what are maybe some factors that are evolving as climate change becomes uh, increasingly prevalent? There are a lot of emergency preparedness agencies at different levels that are trying to help individuals and communities increase their um, their resilience or their resistance to to any type of natural hazard. And many of the things that one would do um, kind of carry over from hazard to hazard. So many of the where I live, there's a high risk of a major earthquake. Many of the things that I might do to be prepared for a major earthquake 
are similar to what I might do to be prepared for a fire. Um, you know, obviously there are some differences, but there are things like knowing how you would evacuate. Um, you know, ideally, and this these are things where where there are multiple levels of responsibility that come together. So you have individuals, you have communities, you have government. I mean, all of these systems ideally would be working together, but knowing um, is what, what's the best route to evacuate? Are there multiple routes to evacuate? Um, things like, you know, having in your home and in your vehicle and in your place of work, if you work outside the home, um, having water, having food, you know, having things that will allow you, if you're cut off, from say electricity um, or from heating, cooling, things like that for several days, are you gonna be able to just keep yourself alive and reasonably comfortable? Um, so people are thinking about things like that. In fire prone areas, um, you know, sometimes there's discussion about having a fireproof box, something like that. So, you know, if you can't take all the documents with you or something like that, having something that is unlikely to to burn in the case of a fire, or maybe you can put a couple of valuables or um, you know, things like that. Um, knowing where, let's say the, a lot of us don't know where the, um, where to turn off the gas to our houses or to our businesses. So things like that to try to, um, to make that area as, as secure as possible. Um, uh, there are a lot of things that, and knowing, knowing what's happening with your neighbors. So, you know, I, where are you going to meet with your loved ones if you have to evacuate? Is there someone nearby in your place of work or your community who has limited mobility? And um, in the case of an emergency, may need some assistance in evacuating. Um, there's also a lot of discussion about alert networks. So, I mean, many of us rely on mobile phones, for example, to alert about emergencies. Well, what if something knocks out the cellular network? Um, you know, so having having a radio, <laughs> there are a lot of things that 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 we're not necessarily conditioned to think about right now um, at the municipal level or, you know, through sort of private networks. There's more and more discussion about how do you ensure that people who um, have hearing impairments or visual impairments, that they're able to get alerts, um, people whose first language is not the, the dominant language in the area, how to get them alerts, um, you know, or people who are not well tied into technology. So how do you get information out to a lot of people and then manage, uh, manage the distribution of those people in, in the event of an emergency? And that's sort of the most immediate um, way that people can prepare. And then there are longer term, longer term things to reduce overall risk. Well, and let's dive into those longer term elements because what you're describing is sort of the uh, immediate needs mm -hmm. uh, if and when there's a wildfire. Longer term, what can you do when you're looking at your own company or organizational security plans if you're in an area prone to wildfires? Yeah, I think there's there's sort of a, a medium term and a super long term. I mean, the really long term is um, it's still worthwhile to try to minimize the extent to which climate is going to continue to change. And so there's long-term efforts to mitigate greenhouse gases. Um, if people are in an area where they have government representation, um, you know, and they have the right to vote, let your elected officials know that this matters to you and hold them to account on, on climate mitigation, things like that. So that's, you know, quite long-term. Um, moderate term, you know, things like trying to work toward infrastructure that is fairly resilient. Um, you know, a, a lot of, this has been in the news quite a bit, but a lot of infrastructure in the United States is failing. Um, you know, it's just not going to do that well under any stress. And those stresses might include wildfire. Um, you know, again, ensuring evacuation routes, thinking about um, local social services. I mean, you might not have a fire in your community, but if there's a fire in the next community over, or if they're affected, and you're relying on, let's say, a lot of your healthcare workers or teachers or something like that come from a different community. Well, there's now you're now isolated. So, are there ways that communities can become more self-sufficient, recognizing that um, that they may be isolated in the event of a wildfire or any natural disaster? We're talking sort of direct impacts of of wildfires here. What are maybe some indirect elements of this that people don't consider you touched on it a little bit where if there's a fire in a community that's mm -hmm. 
maybe not even a neighboring community, maybe, you know, uh, several uh, in a separate region altogether, mm -hmm. how that could potentially affect another part of the country or province or state or what have you, mm -hmm. because we are so interconnected nowadays. But what would be some other indirect risks mm -hmm. that evolve from wildfires that impact a much uh, broader population? Yeah, there are there are quite a few. Um, to name a couple, smoke. People are becoming much more aware of the effects of smoke. And so um, for people that have um, compromised respiratory systems or circulatory systems um, or, or any array of, of um, uh, compromised health, you know, wildfire smoke, sometimes from quite far away, can have uh, negative health outcomes. There's more and more work on the extent to which smoke exposure is affecting um, is affecting embryos, so basically affecting prenatal health um, that and can have quite long term effects. That happens with other animals too. So there are effects on livestock. Um, you know, so there are long term health effects of smoke, and then there are economic effects. Um, and all of these obviously can interact. But um, there are some data and a lot of anecdotes about people's plans for recreation changing. People saying, for example, I'm not going to go to a national park in this state or this province in August because I'm concerned that it's going to be really smoky and it's not going to be enjoyable. Um, so there are economic effects to the recreation sector. Um, we're becoming more aware in, um, in California and Oregon, and I'm sure it's the case further north in Canada, too, that um, wine grape quality is compromised by smoke and in some cases by um, by ash deposition and things like that. So you can have really wide ranging um, economic effects of um, of wildfires through through the smoke. And people that study the um, chemical composition of smoke also point out that smoke is not all not all smoke is equal. So um, you know what is released in terms of chemicals uh, if you have homes burning, buildings burning, um, is different than what is released if you have vegetation burning. So the people are just starting to look in much more detail at the how the composition of smoke affects human health and affects um, various economic sectors. If a wildfire cuts off a major highway, that will inevitably result in disruption. If uh, the consequences of a wildfire, you know, uh, we talk about sometimes uh, how uh, because of the effects on the soil that can maybe result in landslides months and months and months mm -hmm. down the road that might also shut down a highway or a railway. Yes. So Eric, I'd be curious to know uh, a little bit more in terms of how we would convey this to maybe somebody who's listening here saying, we don't live in a wildfire prone area. Mm -hmm. We don't deal with smoke too bad. Right. I mean, we'll, we'll be OK. Why is this a security risk when you come across someone like that? Because I'm sure you've had these conversations before with other people. How would you explain to them that even though they don't live in a region prone to wildfires, why they should be concerned about them and subsequently why they should factor this into a security angle? Many places that traditionally have not been wildfire prone are becoming wildfire prone or they're becoming wildfire prone over a longer period of time during the year. Um, people are starting to say in much of the West that there's no wildfire season anymore, that it's year round. And fires are, especially with smoke, starting to affect people in parts of the country where um, sort of the, it's maybe wildfire has been a risk, but it's been a much lower risk than a hurricane or a tornado or something like that. So unfortunately, um, I think there are over time, I'm likely to be fewer and fewer areas where there is no wildfire risk. Um, so that's so that's one thing. The other is, as you mentioned, the the cascading effect. So um, you know, maybe someone lives in an area that's not wildfire prone, but they were planning a vacation somewhere that is wildfire prone. Well, you know, maybe you're not going to be able to to go to those areas, or um, as you mentioned, the supply chain. You know, your supply of of goods and services very well might be disrupted by something happening quite far away. Um, and then there's also, you know, effects on, this is a little bit further removed from many people's daily lives, but it can be compelling for some people, um, risks to national security. So for example, um, more and more 
military installations in the United States are thinking about whether they can um, create their own power systems or, you know, be, be again, be more self-reliant in the event that they are cut off by by many, any number of natural hazards or of, you know, human caused hazards, but basically the idea of self-sufficiency. And that is exactly where I want to go next, because Erica, you sent me some really great reading material that I think would be worth sharing with the audience uh, in terms of uh, treating wildfires and climate disasters overall as a national security risk. Again, you don't necessarily connect those dots between the two, uh, because, you, you know, when, when you think of a wildfire, you think of a tornado, you think of a hurricane, what are you, you're, you're looking at the, the destruction uh, brought on by the flames or the uh, damage caused by strong winds or the flooding caused by a tropical storm. And you're not thinking the uh, cascading effects, if you will, mm -hmm. that result from these, uh, from these disasters. One of the interesting things uh, that uh, we happened to, to look up was the American uh, Department of Defense paying close attention to this. They even have something they call the Defense Climate Assessment Tool. And I have to quote this uh, from their own website where it says it's a critical first step in addressing the potential physical harm, security impacts and degradation and readiness resulting from global climate change. Pretty remarkable to hear the American military treating this like a threat. Mm -hmm. And I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this, Erica, because do we do we really need to have a shift in mentality, whether you're the U.S. Army or if you're a security professional managing a business of a dozen people? Does do we need that that shift in mentality of it's not just a climate crisis? It is, in fact, a security threat. Yes. <laughs> and and it's not me saying that or it's not just me saying that, you know, it's the the nation's military leadership saying that it's, you know, e prominent economists saying that it's people in just about every sector. This is not a political issue. Um, this is affecting people worldwide, whether they would like to recognize it or not. Mm hmm. One of the interesting things about that tool that the Department of Defense uses, uh, it looks at kind of three components that calls exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity when it comes mm -hmm. to vulnerability. Let's drill down on that a little bit. And, and again, I, I'm looking this up and I'm thinking if you're a, a, a corporate security professional, this would probably be, probably be a pretty useful guide, mm -hmm. especially if you live in, a, in, a, in an area prone to wildfires. Yeah, and then those three components that you talked about of exposure and sensitivity and adaptive capacity, those are being used in just about every sector. So, you know, the Audubon Society is using those in terms of looking at, um, you know, how might how might climate change affect migratory songbirds? And the military is looking at those factors in terms of how might this affect national security. So, you know, really simply put, exposure is sort of what's your likelihood of um of these of certain changes occurring in your area or to your sector. So how exposed are you? Um, you know, just like one might say, are you how exposed is your skin to um, to frostbite on a cold and windy day? Something like that. You know, cover up because otherwise your skin's exposed and the tip of your nose is going to freeze. Um, sensitivity is kind of how susceptible are you to that? So someone who is um, frail. Maybe is more susceptible to a really to a, a wind chill, um, to minus fifteen wind chill. Someone who's frail is going to be more susceptible than someone who is, um, you know, fairly fairly healthy and fairly robust. So you have that of kind of sensitivity is sometimes called vulnerability, and then adaptive capacity. What resources do you have to a combination of reduce your exposure and reduce your sense sensitivity. So, you know, is it possible to add more insulation to your home? Um, you know, is it possible to um, to have some kind, to, to go somewhere else, to get out of the smoky area? You know, do you have the means to be able to do that? Um, so any combination of factors or, you know, getting if for your business, getting the types of materials you need from another source if, if source A is cut off. Um, and all of these interact. I mean, exposure and sensitivity and adaptive capacity are not mutually exclusive. But thinking about these, these three factors often helps um, 
any, you know, individuals, communities, businesses, what have you kind of look at their risk and think about how to mitigate that risk and trade it off against um, against other factors that they're thinking about. And I can't help but think if the U.S. military considers climate change to be a threat, you know, why don't you? You know, mm-hmm. I, I mean, that's just the way that I that I look at this. Um, you know, they uh, rec- not too long ago released their first ever climate strategy earlier this year. And again, I'm going to read from this because I think it's pretty remarkable hearing them talk about this, where they say, quote, an increased risk of armed conflict in places where established Mm -hmm. social orders and populations are disrupted. The risk will rise even more where climate affects compound social instability, reduce access to basic necessities, undermine fragile governments and economies, damage vital infrastructure and lower agricultural production. Mm-hmm. Again, to hear the most powerful military in the world address climate change in these terms is really eye-opening. And I, I, I'd be curious to hear more of your perspective on this, Erica, but this should be a wake-up call for businesses everywhere, especially if you're a security professional at a large corporation or organization. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think what, what you quoted from um, recognizes the risks that at many different levels. So, you know, there's sort of an immediate risk. So for the military, for example, let's say um, an installation is along the coast. Well, you know, if you have if you have a storm coming in, it's more difficult for soldiers or, you know, whatever branch of the military to train. And so you're compromising military readiness because it's that much more difficult to train people. You're compromising uses or the uses of that area are being compromised because, for example, it's underwater (laughs) or, you know, certain roads are inoperable um, or anything like that. So you have these local effects. You have more wide ranging effects when you think about instability. So there's instability in other countries. There's, you know, the potential for deploying people from nation X to nation Y and their risks increasing and kind of spreading resources thinner. Um, There's the potential for sometimes what are called climate migrants, you know, people who are displaced from from area X to move into area Y. And we see this, you know, even within relatively small regions of wildfires of, let's say the community next next to your community has a lot of displaced people. Well, you know, a human tendency is to say, come in, we're going to try to help you. We're going to set up a shelter. We're going to try to give you food, clothes, things like that. Over the longer term, the community, the receiving community can't necessarily double in size overnight. So if people can't go back home, you basically have not just the community that was hit by the climate related disaster, but you have strains that carry over to other communities. And you can look at that at the national level. So, you know, there's both you're straining, you're straining a particular place um, and you're spreading out those resources more, you know, because people want to help their neighbors and so their global neighbors, too, by trying to um, trying to help them in these times. It's just spreading limited resources more thinly. I always like to try and end these episodes with a bit of uh, not necessarily uh, putting a positive spin on it, if you will, but maybe a bit of advice, something that uh, listeners and viewers can take away from our conversation because we have identified the problem we've explained why wildfires and climate change uh on a bigger scale are security risks but what would be some of your advice or some guidance maybe you could offer to security professionals who are already dealing with you know civil unrest we're emerging from the pandemic there and there's geopolitical tensions around the world so now we're adding wildfires and climate change onto a, yet a, another concern, a growing list of worries that security professionals for all, from all sorts of organizations mm-hmm. have to consider. So when it comes to wildfires and when it comes to climate change, how would you advise a security professional who's already got his or her plate just absolutely full with a bunch of other crises that are taking place or could happen? Yeah. I guess I would think about it at two levels. One is sort of, you know, the individual level, the sort of member of society level, and the other is the professional level. And, you know, as a member of society, there are a lot of things that people can do to try to protect themselves and their loved ones, their communities, their homes. I mean, all of the sort of preparedness things from from having a radio to to knowing where you might be able to use as an evacuation route to, you know, um, 
when you have to replace your roof, replacing it with something that's more fire resistant. So there are those types of things. There's also the fact that security professionals, I mean, they have influence, they have power. They have the ear in many cases of politicians. They're influential politically, they're infinite, influential economically. And speaking up um, in places where they're listened to and saying, hey, you know, we're gonna use our power in these ways. We're gonna get public messages out as professionals. We're going to talk to legislators as professionals. Um, you know, private groups can lobby in some parts of the world. So making sure that their concerns are heard um, by as many people as possible and putting the force of, of the respect for their profession and the, um, and the economic power that they have behind, um, behind trying to respond to these security risks. Erica, I really appreciate your insight. Uh, this has been a, a fantastic conversation, and I think one angle of security risks that maybe more people listening to this are now going to think about in this changing world. Um, if people want to find out maybe more about you or, or if you have any resources to direct them to, what would be a good place for them to start? The Oregon Climate Change Research Institute has a website. Uh, use your favorite search engine <laughs> and find us. Erica Fleischman is the director of the Oregon Climate Change Research Institute and a professor at Oregon State University joining us on SITREP. I'm Tristan Field-Jones. Thank you for listening to this week's edition of the podcast. If you'd like to get in touch, you can email me at sitrep at samdesk.io or follow us on Twitter at samdeskofficial. Until next time, stay safe out there.